Few colleges can match the storied success of the University of North Carolina. Throughout the basketball team's 111 years of play, they've made 20 trips to the Final Four and have brought home six collegiate championships. Such lavish success is bound to send guys to the NBA. And at the time of this recording, North Carolina has produced 98 NBA players, trailing only UCLA and the University of Kentucky. There is no shortage of household names when it comes to UNC alumni. Of course, it begins with Michael Jordan, but who can forget about guys like James Worthy, Vince Carter, Jerry Stackhouse, and Brad Doherty, among others. The guys I mentioned above experienced great success in college, and all of them went on to the NBA and experienced success there as well. Granted, it was to varying degrees. Today's subject, Kendall Marshall, deserves mention when talking about UNC greats. Unfortunately, he didn't fare that well among getting to the NBA, but sometimes it just doesn't pan out for certain guys. Kendall Marshall's journey to UNC begins in Virginia, more specifically Bishop O'Connell High School in Arlington. While there, the oversized point guard established himself as an elite floor general and someone who played the point guard position the prototypical way. As a senior, Marshall averaged 15 points, 9 rebounds, and 6 assists while leading Bishop O'Connell to the Virginia Independent Schools Championship. Although his numbers weren't as inflated as some of his contemporaries, Marshall was named a Parade High School All-American, and 247 Sports recognized his talent by ranking him second in the state of Virginia and 27th overall in a class that has since produced a serious amount of NBA talent, including Kyrie Irving, Harrison Barnes, Tristan Thompson, Enos Cantor, Tobias Harris, Joe Harris, and Victor Oladipo. High major Division I coaches respected Marshall's game just as much as the recruiting outlets did, and the Virginia native fielded offers from Georgetown, Villanova, and Virginia before ultimately deciding on UNC. The Tar Heels team that Marshall joined had no shortage of talent. Marshall, along with Barnes and Reggie Bullock, headlined the recruiting class, and in total, that squad featured eight parade All-Americans, six of whom went on to play in the NBA. Despite being one of the premier point guards on the high school circuit, Kendall Marshall started his collegiate career as a backup to Larry Drew, a junior at the time. The battles between the two proved to be fierce. Drew was coming off a respectable sophomore season wherein he became the starting point guard, but Marshall was the more talented player in most facets. It was most apparent when it came to passing and facilitating the offense. Kendall Marshall directed traffic on the floor like a chess master, capable of seeing the offense and defense multiple plays ahead. Additionally, he was able to execute a vast array of passes of varying degrees of difficulty. Following a horrific defeat at the hands of Georgia Tech, Roy Williams knew it was time for a change. UNC was on a roll to begin the season and headed into that game against Georgia Tech with a 12 and 4 record. At the time, the Yellow Jackets were a sub 500 team and had no business beating the Tar Heels at all, let alone by 20. Final score was 78-58. North Carolina shot less than 28% from the field overall and were forced into 18 turnovers by the Yellow Jackets swarming defense. Marshall played 19 minutes that evening and had a modest performance with six assists and four rebounds, but his counterpart Drew did almost nothing offensively outside of two assists. Two days later, Marshall was officially named the Tar Heels starting point guard, and he led his team into battle against Clemson and helped them get back into the win column with a 75-65 victory. It was another modest performance where Marshall had five assists and five points. Larry Drew also played pretty well that evening, adding in eight points and four assists of his own. Marshall continued to start at point guard for the next couple of games, but the minutes allocation between him and Larry Drew was almost 50-50. Every night, they were playing roughly the same amount of minutes, and Roy Williams chose to utilize them in that way because it's a luxury for a coach to have two starting caliber players, one to have in the starting lineup and one to come off the bench. Unfortunately, that wouldn't last that long because shortly after Kendall Marshall was named the starter, Larry Drew transferred to UCLA. In 21 games with Larry Drew on the team, 
Kendall Marshall averaged about 17 minutes per night. In the 16 games without him, his minutes more than doubled to almost 35. Roy Williams quite actually had nobody else to play in point guard other than Kendall Marshall, and the freshman guard could have easily crumbled under his newfound pressure. Fortunately for the entire team, Kendall Marshall played some of the best basketball of his life. In those 16 games where Larry Drew was no longer on the team, Marshall averaged eight and a half assists a night and shot 37% from the three-point line. He cracked double-digit dimes six times, including 16 against Florida State and then 14 against the University of Washington in the second round of the NCAA tournament. UNC season came to a close in the Elite Eight when they won up against Kentucky. Marshall recorded eight assists and had four steals, but shot an absolutely putrid two of 10 from the floor. After just one season and his freshman season at that, Kendall Marshall was already statistically the best playmaker in the ACC. Overall, he handed out 230 dimes at a rate of 6.2 per night, both of which were tops in the ACC and were also fifth and ninth respectively in the country. Heading into the 2011-2012 campaign, the Tar Heels were almost identical to the year before. Barnes, Bullock, and Marshall all returned, as did Tyler Zeller and John Henson. Williams bolstered the team even more by adding two top 15 recruits according to the RSCI, James Michael McAdoo and PJ Hairston. Out of all the guys coming back, Kendall Marshall was arguably the team's most important player. It was his responsibility to make sure the offense ran as optimally as possible. And he did so knowing that he was the only true point guard on the roster. Dexter Strickland saw a considerable amount of time, but he only appeared in 19 games. Even if there was another point guard on the roster and they tried to take the starting job from Kendall Marshall, there was almost zero chance that they were going to be able to usurp him. He had two 15 assist games in his first four appearances that season. Later on, he'd set a new season high with 16 assists, a feat that he would accomplish twice. With Marshall as the train conductor, UNC constructed one of the best seasons in school history. They finished fourth overall in the AP poll and amassed 32 wins to just six losses. They possessed an exceptionally potent offense, one that finished third in the country in scoring average and 19th in scoring efficiency. Expectedly, they earned a one seed in the NCAA tournament and beat Vermont, Creighton, and Ohio University before falling to Kansas in the Elite Eight. One of the reasons that Carolina failed to punch through to the Final Four and potentially even make an appearance in the national championship game was that they lost Kendall Marshall to a fractured wrist in the closing minutes of their game against Creighton, and he went on to miss their final two games of the season. Before we get to the numbers that Kendall Marshall posted as a sophomore, you need to know that there are few words that can appropriately describe what this man accomplished in his, in his second season at UNC. Spectacular, does a decent job, as does terrific, outstanding, all of those great superlatives. They all work, but they don't really convey just how otherworldly the young point guard was when you really think about it the he was it was it was just historic there's no other way to describe it it was a historic season from Kendall Marshall he finished that campaign with 17 games of more than 10 assists the most by a power five conference player since sports reference started tracking that in 2010 Marshall dished out 351 assists over 36 games a rate of 9.8. Those aren't just university records. Those are still standing ACC records. According to Sports Reference, whose database dates back to 1985, that mark of 9.8 is the 10th best single season mark since that time. And Kendall Marshall is just one of four guys to ever have more than 350 assists in a season, joining Anthony Manuel, Avery Johnson, and Mark Wade. 
Such extraordinary playmaking led to Marshall receiving the Bob Cousy Award, which is given each year to the best point guard in the country. Marshall rounded out his stat line by averaging 8.1 points and shooting about 35% from the three-point line. It was almost impossible for Kendall Marshall to build on what he had just accomplished. With his draft stock being at its highest, he entered his name in the 2012 NBA draft. By far, his biggest strengths were his impeccable passing in conjunction with his brilliance as a floor general. He was the type of point guard who could happily coexist alongside a star or two and not get fed up if shot attempts weren't coming his way. Conversely, Marshall's unselfishness raised some questions. He almost always prioritized the success of his teammates and was just a very passive scorer. Getting to the NBA, that would be an issue because teams wouldn't commit on the dribble drive if they knew you were prone to passing out of it. Surely that could have been fixed if Marshall just addressed his lack of aggressiveness, but that's a big if. Where Marshall was the least impressive was on defense and as an athlete overall. Those two traits were inherently connected. Marshall wasn't quick enough to stay in front of guys at the collegiate level. And if you're struggling with that kind of effort in college, it's only going to be exacerbated when you get to the NBA and have to deal with the 1% of the 1% of elite athletes on a nightly basis. Kendall Marshall was the 13th guy off the board that night, landing with the Phoenix Suns. At the time, his placement seemed fine, but of course, with hindsight, it's now a little suspect, especially considering that both Chris Middleton and Draymond Green weren't picked until the second round. For the sake of brevity, I want to point out that Marshall's playing career ceased just four seasons after he had been drafted but it wasn't because of a lack of talent. I feel like a broken record at this point because I feel like I've brought this up in multiple videos and I've brought it up on multiple podcasts, but success for guys like Kendall Marshall in the NBA is almost entirely situational because he didn't have superstar talent. In Marshall's case, it was one of those instances where he just didn't land with a competent organization and he repeatedly failed to land with competent organizations. The Suns team that he got drafted by won just 25 games his rookie season, and he put forth admirable effort despite averaging less than 15 minutes per night. On a per 100 possessions per night basis, Kendall Marshall averaged 10 and a half assists and had multiple 10 plus assist outings over the last month of that season. While he didn't excel at anything else, Marshall proved to be a reliable floor general and an above average passer, just as he had exhibited in college. But for some reason, for some mind boggling reason, the Phoenix Suns decided to trade him after just one season. Let me reiterate this. The Phoenix Suns traded their lottery pick for Emeka Okafor and a protected first round pick in 2014 that they used on Tyler Ennis. Okafor never suited up for the organization and Tyler Ennis played just 58 minutes before he too got traded. Bad organizations stay bad for a reason. And it's reasons like this as to why the Phoenix Suns spent much of the 2010s being a bad all-around organization. Following that debacle that was his stint in Phoenix, Marshall landed with the Los Angeles Lakers and he played well because he saw legitimate minutes. In 54 games, Marshall averaged about 30 minutes and also averaged 8.8 assists and eight points while shooting 40% from three. He tallied more than 10 assists 25 times, six of which saw him eclipse 15. And had he qualified for the assist per game leaderboard, he would have finished tied for second with John Wall and Ty Lawson. That Lakers team was coming off a 45 win season the year before, but they won just 27 games while Marshall was there. However, that was largely because Kobe Bryant got hurt just six games into the season. Regardless of that, Marshall was the primary facilitator for guys like Nick Young, Pau Gasol, and Jody Meeks. 
After his time in Tinseltown, Marshall signed on with the Milwaukee Bucks. In a stroke of just horrible luck, Marshall tore his ACL just 28 games into his tenure with the Bucks. Prior to the injury, Marshall was again only seeing about 15 minutes, but he got stuck behind Brandon Knight, who to his credit was playing pretty well at that time, and he was good for about 18 points and five assists a night. Later on, Milwaukee facilitated a deal for Michael Carter Williams, but ultimately this didn't really impact Marshall for two reasons. The first, he was already hurt when the trade went down. And the second being that he got traded back to Phoenix shortly after MCW's arrival. Marshall's injury was extra unfortunate because the Bucks were the only team that seemingly had a clue as to what was going on. Although they finished with just 41 wins, they were trying to build a team around Giannis and Chris Middleton, both of whom were still very young. While I don't think that Marshall would have taken the starting job from Michael Carter Williams, had he been healthy, I think he would have been able to contribute at a level that was similar to what he was doing for the Lakers the year before. Just the only difference was that he would have been coming off the bench instead of being in the starting lineup. The last team that employed Kendall Marshall were the Philadelphia 76ers. He appeared in just 30 games for statistically one of the worst teams in NBA history and again made just minimal contributions. After posting nearly nine assists with the Lakers that one season, that number had dropped to less than three over his last two seasons combined. And on November 23rd, 2017, Kendall Marshall officially announced his retirement from professional basketball. After hanging up his sneakers, Marshall returned to the University of North Carolina and graduated in December of 2018. While studying, he spent a sizable amount of time with the basketball team and Roy Williams was gracious enough to reward him with an official spot on the coaching staff in a position that had been formed specifically for Kendall Marshall. And he became the first ever director of recruiting in North Carolina's history. As a result, one could assume that Marshall held a prominent role in helping bring in seven RSCI top 100 recruits over his two seasons. Unfortunately, his run would end after those two seasons because of Roy Williams' resignation this past April. On the bright side, Kendall Marshall is still not even 30 years old at the time of this recording. With a resume like his to go along with his experience, he could provide valuable knowledge to any organization at any level of basketball. And I think it's only a matter of time before Marshall returns to the basketball landscape. As always, I want to thank you guys so, so much for coming to hang out with me. If this is your first time, welcome. If you're a returning viewer, welcome back. Everything I'm associated with is in the description down below. That's social medias. That's the podcast that I host that is available pretty much wherever podcasts are hosted. As always, if you liked the video, leave a like, a dislike if you didn't like it, and subscribe and hit the notification bell to see more content just like this. Once again, I'm appreciative of any and all the support, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.